So here we are Monday, September 25th, 2006. And it's just light after light and I'm just sitting in traffic. I mean, it's at a snail's pace. I am starting to sweat, my heart is pounding. I'm sitting there thinking to myself, this is the biggest game of my life. Um, the reopening of the Superdome, this means so much to so many people, how can I be late to this game? So I remember taking the drive over and I, I, and I usually I have like the music blaring and I got my pump up, you know, playlist. I had no music on, I had the windows down because I wanted to smell New Orleans on the drive in. I wanted to see people tailgating in the streets. I wanted to hear their music. Outside of the dome, there's this big party going on. So you wonder, okay, how many of them will actually make it into the dome? And then, you know, what will the motions be? I was sitting at the Poitras exit, looking at the time tick down. I consider pulling my car off, parking it, and running. They send out a state trooper, and he's able to navigate him to the stadium. And as he pulls up into the parking garage, he's got this old Land Rover, the kind you would see in the safari, like beat up, you know, with a rack. So I pull into the parking garage, and my metal safari rack hits, and I get stuck. And I called the security guy and said, could you please come and grab my car? I've got to get in the locker room. The two things I remember that were unique to my experience were, they wanted every player to use this weird red carpet valet service that was right in the middle of the arriving crowd. I didn't want to do that, so I drove in the back entrance and parked in my spot. The other moment was during the national anthem minutes before kickoff. I vividly remember looking across the field and seeing the Falcons and looking up at the crowd in the dome and thinking, it is impossible for us to lose tonight. friends is the famous Louisiana Superdome. Yes siree, there's nothing quite like it. Why they tell me it's so big on the inside that you could plunk the entire Astrodome right down on the stadium floor and still have room for a track meet. And I'll tell you something else. Once you get inside. The Superdome over the years had a certain mythic quality among sports fans. It had the great name, the Superdome, and it hosted all the big events. It had fights and it had basketball games and it had football games and it had the great advantage of being in New Orleans, which is one of those cities that everyone says, boy, I'd like to go to New Orleans. Do you think I'd get a ticket to that? It's been a destination city for centuries. One of those rare places where great voyages both begin and end. Where cultures collide and coincide. Where people of all types gather in the concert halls, on the riverbanks, in the staterooms, and since 1975, in the Superdome, at home games of the New Orleans Saints. The Saints became a part of the uh, cultural fabric of the city over the years. Even though they didn't win a lot, people loved them anyway. They were sort of the Chicago Cubs of the NFL. Archie Manning has been sacked, what, seven times. Even Gumbo's given up. It's a family affair. Everybody, you know, loves the Saints because it's part of their family. We cried with them, we booed, we paper bagged them. <laughs> I mean, people spend their last dollar to put, to go to Saints games and buy their Saints tickets because it's just like Mardi Gras, it's embedded in the city. I learned how to whistle when I was 15 from my uncle. He taught me how to whistle with my fingers. 
by the time I was 18 years old, I was going to Saints games. We'd just get any tickets, and then we'd go down to the club section, and I'd start whistling, and I'd clear out like five or six seats. All my friends would come in. I did that for a few years. It became the center of New Orleans Festival Universe. Sometimes it was more. In August of 2005, with a hurricane called Katrina approaching, the Superdome was open to roughly 1,500 special needs patients who could not evacuate the city. But as the storm drew closer, New Orleans' iconic sporting palace was forced into a greater role as the city's refuge of last resort. Now this thing that went from 1,500 to over 35,000. People come in the building. You put a lot of pressure on your infrastructure when you do that. For a typical football game, we'll have 3,000 workers here. When we start uh, loading in evacuees on a Sunday afternoon, right before Katrina, we had probably 20 essential employees on our staff. Fortunately, we were able to get 325 National Guard. By the time the dome was filling with locals, the Saints had already left town, departing days early for their final preseason game in Oakland. That's when you started to say, okay, well, hey, look, we've done this evacuation thing before. I'll go ahead and pack, you know, a, a week's worth of clothes. I'll get to hang out in California for a little while, and, you know, it'd be a nice little vacation. You know, that's, that's the thought process. At the time, I was focused on football and really had no idea that this hurricane would change not only the history of New Orleans, but also my personal history. On August 29, 2005, Hurricane Katrina landed in New Orleans. There was no historical precedent for the damage the storm caused, including at the city's largest, supposedly safest haven, where unthinkably, the roof began to tear off the building. See that? We have rainwater in the building. You know, it's water dripping everywhere, so we had to start second-guessing. Like, did, uh, did we make a bad decision coming here? Everything was coming at you very quickly, and, and, and you were really making life and death decisions. I mean, you have to envision now 150 helicopters over the top of the city, picking people off rooftops or off levees and bringing them, trying to bring them here. So these guys are flying over the top of each other, landing in front of each other. That was tense. I mean, I would stop and look at it every so often and just wonder how they didn't crash. In this area over here, I think this is where the guy actually jumped off the balcony. You know, while a lot of those things that we heard on the TV, uh, no, that didn't happen in the soup. No, I was in here. It happened. You know, you had people being raped in some of these restrooms. That, that wasn't nothing that nobody should have ever saw. People was pretty down. It was getting really like uh, chaotic inside the Superdome. And so we figured the only way to really inspire people was to do like they did during the Civil Rights Movement. And that's to sing spiritual songs. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, all around the world, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That event right there would be something that will show us they did have some really good people down there that were spiritual people, people that were survivors and fighters. You know, they still had a positive outlook even though it was really, really bad. Over the next four days, the Superdome lost all but emergency power. It lost running water and working toilets. It became an island of 35,000 stranded people so many of whom experienced the worst moments of their lives in the same place they had once felt the best. A place that when they finally left, many thought would be left for dead. I remember saying to the, uh, to the group, get a good look at this place tonight because you'll probably never be back here again. It may be gone forever. And certainly the next day when I flew out, it was just a devastating moment. Our city, our place of work, the place that we love so much, the Superdome, I thought it was over.
We came in the Friday after the game to see some of the devastation. I was, I was in awe. The good and bad part about it, just seeing some victims that were being rescued right then, the first thing some of them asked me, did we win against Oakland? And I'm thinking to myself, dude, you gotta be kidding me. You just were rescued off of a home and you're worried about the preseason game and that just shows you the connection that they have uh, with, the, with the team in the city. New Orleans and his team spent 2005 apart, beginning when the Saints' first scheduled home game was held at Giant Stadium in New Jersey. There were Saints fans in attendance, but their focus was not on football. A lot of stuff started to set in in that game where I'm like, man, I don't, is it, we're going to be playing somewhere else for this whole season. What's the rest of our season going to look like is what I was thinking. Will we ever play back at the Dome? Seeing those street signs with the water just underneath them, seeing the Superdome, it was devastating. I did go through a time of depression because it, it, it was hard. It was very hard. It was crushing the first time being back, having to walk in here with a respirator, a hazmat suit, seeing the trash, the garbage, the debris, the human waste, the mold, thinking, this is impossible. It was a shock. Blankets and clothes and food wrappers lying around, and the smell was, was just horrific. And I couldn't imagine what it was like for people who were stuck in here for days and days. Um, at one point, we came to a spot in the concourse where there was just a large pool of blood, and no one had any idea how it got there. It was just, it was very eye-opening, and it was, it was extremely disturbing. And uh, I actually went home and sat down and cried after seeing it. The battered Superdome was the new symbol of New Orleans. Not gone, but uninhabitable in a condition that helped send the Saints' operations to a makeshift headquarters 500 miles away in San Antonio, Texas. Steve Gleason, who today is battling ALS, was a Saint safety in 2005. We practiced on high school baseball fields and the Kmart parking lot, so those logistical hurdles were the team's greatest challenges. It was a long, unsuccessful year. Saints have now lost four in a row. They dropped to two and six. The Saints became nomads. They played the rest of their home schedule in San Antonio and Baton Rouge, making their faithful question if they'd ever return to New Orleans. The hurricane comes through and people from San Antonio think they can steal our team away from us and uh, they're trying to kick us while we're down and we don't really appreciate that. It was hard for them because their own homes were destroyed. And the Saints leaving, that was just something that was just too hard to bear. This ain't the first flood. It ain't the first hurricane. Paul Tagliavoo will not let us go on That's one it. knee without a team. We love this team. We wanted it. I mean, look at me. Dude's in tears. But we love the team, man, and we'll do anything to make sure that it stays here. In December, NFL Commissioner Paul Tagliavoo traveled to New Orleans to tour the devastated city. Look at that, unbelievable. This is obviously the worst, the hardest hit. Still soaking wet. There's no substitute for your own eyes. This is 90 days after Katrina. By this point, we had taken out all the wet carpet, all the bad sheetrock, all the ceiling tiles. We had stripped this building naked. I had lunch served on what would be the 50 yard line and had the architects explaining how it's going to take two years. We'd be fortunate to get it open for Sugar Bowl in 2007, uh, and that's if everything went according to plan. And I said, you can't wait till 2007. It's got to open for 2006. Because if they play a lot of their games in San Antonio and Baton Rouge for another season, you'll never get them back. I remember going into our little office, and I say, we need to accelerate the schedule and get the building open in what is now 10 months and there was silence in the room. They said, well, that's not possible. In January 2006, recovery efforts in New Orleans were well underway when the Saints began to rebuild their team after a three-win season. 
They hired Sean Payton to be their new head coach and signed Chargers cast-off quarterback Drew Brees. Payton wanted only the most highly motivated players. Among the Saints he inherited, Steve Gleason was a perfect fit. He's a guy that played linebacker, he played safety, he didn't quite know what was his perfect position, but if you gave him an assignment, like with enthusiasm, like Here, here's your role, he would embrace it and be as good a player as you could ever want. He was a fan favorite, partly because Gleason was such a fan of his adopted home of New Orleans. He showed up at the Maple Leaf and I'm like, wait a minute, that's Steve Gleason. There were certain bands that he was a regular for, and he fit in very well to the local culture and loved it. After a game, most of those guys don't even want to talk to anybody. He's going to go right in the thick of it and just hang out and be normal. One, two, one, two, three. In the summer of 2006, the $200 million Superdome reconstruction project continued. 35 local contractors embraced the task of building the equivalent of two houses a day, in addition to refurbishing everything they did not need to build from scratch. To clean and sanitize every seat in the seating bowl, you had to cover the entire seating bowl in plastic. So these guys were working underneath this plastic cover, cleaning each individual seat by hand for a month or more. Many, including Saints owner Tom Benson, expressed concern that the work would not be done on time. We've got a group of about 30 people in the room, and uh, he was really interested in one thing, were we gonna be able to play in the stadium on September 25th? I looked around the room and just had silence, and all of a sudden I said, Mr. Benson, you'll be able to play. And he looked over at me and pointed at me and said, I'm gonna hold you to that. Mr. Benson started talking again. He says, look, got a new coach, got a new quarterback. We're going to have a good team. And I went, Mr. Benson, we're going to hold you to that. And Mr. Benson looked at me, and then he started laughing. And of course, the whole room broke up. Three days before the Superdome was scheduled to reopen on Monday night football, Sean Payton surprised his team by holding a practice there. It was the first time many Saints stepped foot in the building. And after practice, Payton brought in a second surprise. He had Doug Thornton and the Superdome staff there and had Doug talk and speak to the team about, about uh, his, his experiences and, and uh, how difficult it was to reopen the Dome. And then Sean said, I want to congratulate these guys. These are the guys that are the reason that we're here. They rebuilt this place so that we would have a place to play football. And then Sean said, but my job as a head coach is to get you ready to play football. And the only way I know to do it is to recreate what's going to happen here on Monday night. So on cue, we darken the house lights. And you hear the bum, 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 bum of Monday night football. We watched a video that documented the previous 13 months. It allowed the guys that had lived through the last year to vent some of their feelings. It also allowed the new guys to appreciate the magnitude and significance of the return. And I look around and I see the players. We were all standing there weeping. It was a powerful moment. I mean, all of us were in tears. Um, just thinking about and understanding what that game was going to mean to so many people. And the lights came back up, and uh, Sean said, Look, it's going to be a special night, but it's only going to be special if we win. If we lose, it's just another football game. So I want you to go home and get ready to come back here and kick some ass. <laughs> I would have run through the wall. <laughs> that night in that building, I think, was the first time we felt pressure. Because that's when you recognize how big this thing was, and it's like, man, all the people we just saw on that little highlight reel, and all these guys who, you know, worked their butts off to get the stadium ready, and all the people we've been drinking with in the community all off season. Now it's all on the line, man. I mean, we better come ready to play.
that morning, I got there really early at Superdome. It was like 10 in the morning. And I uh, dropped my easel and my paint bag, and I just, start, just started balling. You know, I thought I was alone. You know, so I hear, it's okay, French. I cried my first time back here, too. And I'm like, <laughs> what do you, who's here? I turn around, and Steve Gleason's like 10 feet away from me. Right away, we started talking, man, you can feel this, man. Like, do you feel that? Anticipation really doesn't do it justice. I mean, it was, when you got here, there's almost tension. It's just like going on your first date. You know, you're nervous and you're excited, but you can't wait to get there. Usually I'll show up before first hand scan, maybe two hours beforehand, and this time I think it was a good five or six hours before. And I wasn't alone. There was already thousands of people gathered outside the dome. After a year of the frustrations, to finally have something good happen, something familiar that we all missed, everybody just wanted to be there. As the confetti is being blown, I'm up at the top on the flat roof looking out over the crowd. It was like a religious experience in a way. You know the season ticket holders that are sitting in your sections. So again, it's family and they're coming in. We're home. The whole city, it's a family. I'm proud because, you know, I'm part of it. We wanted to come back like it was a big event. So we got like a tuxedo and the whistle. It's just, uh, it just meant a lot to come back into this building. When Katrina happened, this was the meeting place. Then here we are now with the first game back. This is the meeting place again. Once again, the Superdome was serving its intended purpose as a cathedral of recreation, hosting U2, Green Day, and a Saints game all in the same night. And in the process, stirring memories as it never had before. As I got closer to the Superdome, uh, the anxiety started setting in for me. That the, you know, what we had experienced um, after Katrina, you call it PTSD if you want to, um, it probably was. And even to this day, I've, I've been in the Superdome numerous times since for ball games or events. And, and when I get in those hallways, it still gets to me. I still smell it. I went to the seat that I sat in when we in here for refuge because I wanted, I wanted to see the Superdome in a different light. Last time I was in here, they had a hole right there. Oh, look, that might be the section where that happened with that young lady. Oh, that might be the section where that guy jumped off her. Let me go back and see if I can recreate a good memory in the same spot. Welcome to Monday Night Football. The last time the thousands gathered here, their mission was survival. Quite simply, tonight is the most significant New Orleans Saints game ever. There was nothing in my experience with Monday Night Football that was ever going to approach the first game back in New Orleans. This had been a vagabond team. This had been a vagabond city. People had left for Houston and other places and never come back. And this was their first opportunity to get back and touch the soil that they left under dire circumstances. I don't care whether you're coaching in this game, whether you're playing in this game, whether you're announcing this game, whether you're a fan in the stands, you're gonna see something out there that you will remember when you are 80 years old. We were cleaning stuff up to the last moment. Um, right up to kickoff, I was walking around just checking things out. And when they kicked the ball off, I just thought, we did it. We did what everyone said we couldn't do. We did it. Listen to that. Does it get any better? Coming up. That's what that moment sort of became known as, the rebirth of New Orleans. And a nice return to the 29-yard line. And that brings Michael Vick and the Atlanta Falcons out to the field. We come out, defense takes the field first, and uh, Mike Vick rolls out on a bootleg, and I rush the edge, and I, and I sack and force a fumble. One of our players, Brian Scott, almost uh, scooped up the, the ball and could have run it in for a touchdown. If you watch our bench on that play, you get this, ah, we had a chance. 
to get on that football. It was forced by Scott Fujita. You just wish he would have held possession of it because it would be Saints football right now at the 29-yard line. Three and out for the Falcons and Vic. So they say that I almost prevented the biggest play in Saints history from happening. But anyway, it went out of bounds and it was fourth down. So the punt return team comes onto the field. I think I was still like flexing my muscles and I'm doing my bow and the whole deal. I'm like, man, I am a rock star in New Orleans. You guys see, see what I just did? Mom, you see that? You see what just happened? So the Falcons were preparing to punt and I had been shooting by the Saints bench and I was gonna move to the end zone so I could shoot Drew Brees and the Saints coming at me. Shooting punts is not really something I normally did. But at the time I stopped and just kind of lined up the Atlanta punter. I know exactly where I was. I was actually on the same sideline. We're on the sideline. I was in the north end zone. We were looking down. Unfortunately, I was at the other end of the field from where the play happened. And as he took the snap, this white streak kind of came in from the left side of my frame. And I just sort of mashed down the shutter. Look out! Right through! A kickoff by Steve Gleason! It is scooped and scored by Curtis DeLoach! Touchdown, New Orleans! Saints have again watching the Superdome, and hearing it too. For nearly a minute after Gleason's punt block, the television broadcasters remained silent as 75,000 Saints fans gave their city back its voice. This is a shared experience in the body politic of the entire country, and you don't want to trump it by trying to believe that you can say something more important than what you are watching. You are hearing this noise, you are watching these people. You're watching what so many in that place thought was an absolute rebirth. And that's what that moment sort of became known as, the rebirth of New Orleans. His reaction, at least to the rest of us, I think for him it was just business as usual. This is the fourth year in a row. Steve Gleason's blocked a punt. He's a specialist in that category. A punt block is one of the rarest plays in football. They, a good team makes a punt block every two years, maybe three years. The scheme is an interior stunt. Where I cross from the right aid gap to the left aid gap. But in order to block a punt that way, the person who's in charge of getting clean, Steve Gleason, his timing has to be clean. He can't get tripped up or he can't get caught off balance and maybe hit one of his own rushers. It sets up perfectly and, and Steve comes underneath and get, get, gets a free run at the punt and then it was like a shotgun blast. I have to this day never heard a sound more meaningful than that football hitting Steve Gleason's hands when he blocked it. Everybody was jumping up, screaming, hollering, high-fiving, and, and crying. It was just electric. Most beer spilled on any football play in history. Probably. Nobody was drinking. I <laughs> promise you nobody was drinking, because it was all on the floor. That's right. Even those watching in a FEMA trailer that night, like Shelton Alexander and his family, felt the power of the rebirth. From that moment, that was us taking our stand. We back, you know, and nothing is gonna stop us. It was like getting a, a you know, a new heart. It's like getting a heart transplant, you know. It's like a scene in a movie where, after all the, the beating we'd taken over the last year, finally, we get a punch in ourselves. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something. It's hard to put into words. Give me a minute. It was like everything that ever happened good in your life, all at one time. It was uh, your, your first communion, it was your birthday, it was your graduation, it was your first date, getting married. 
And then in the back of your mind, it was people you lost. The trials and tribulations that the city went through. To have that type of emotion on a high, you gotta have a great loss. So I'll be very happy if I don't have that high again. Once things had calmed down a little bit, which was about 10 minutes, uh, I looked down and I rolled through my photos and I couldn't believe what was there. And I, I knew I had something special. I, I put it in a bag to send back to the editors and uh, you know, I put stars all over it and I, you know, it was like a little girl drawing in the, in the uh, margins of her notebook. You know, I was, all I needed was a little unicorn in there and uh, Michael loves Steve. About two minutes left in the game, realizing that we about to get this. We up 20 points. And Henderson's to the goal line, and he is in! I started to signal players that I knew. Hey, yo, special man. That's Fred McAfee. Man, give me a football. I need something to remember this. He went straight to the ball bag, and he grabbed one of those footballs and tucked it under his arm. And as soon as the clock says zeros, he came and ran over there and handed me that ball. I lifted it in the air, and everybody around me went in flames. I experienced intense joy that my people could be joyful again and have something of great value to them that they were familiar with. The dome, the game, the saints, to be there for them. That was an overwhelming feeling when you seen water coming down on people that you couldn't really do nothing about. But then to come back and see the game, Thanks to Steve and the Rebirth, it, it, it pushed the other side on it. Everybody felt like if the Saints can rebound like that, then maybe I need to try to rebound. Maybe I need to block a punt in my own life. Now I can't, I can't split this ball up 500,000 ways. I can't do that. I can't cut it up into 500,000 pieces. All right, to give to everybody in this city. But this game ball is going to everybody in this city. This city is getting yeah. this game ball from our organization, this team. This game ball is going to the city of New Orleans. And the hero of this story was underdog Steve Gleason, a seventh year veteran whose intangibles, hard work and dedication are now the embodiment of many New Orleanians. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of a regular dude. Um, and I think a lot of people identify with that, so um, you know they can they can they can take that enjoyment for themselves, and, and I have no problem with that. I get back to the Maple Leaf, and a couple of bartenders come out on the Maple Leaf like, "Yo, Steve Gleason's is in there, man. He's been waiting for you." I'm like, "He's here already." That's what he did after doing that. He came to hang out with some of the locals here. And, uh, and we danced her all night. I remember like it was yesterday. We used to go to the Superdome back in the days. We used to watch the Saints play on Sundays. I remember him. Steve Gleason's punt block kick-started the season in which New Orleans qualified for its first NFC championship. And while Gleason retired from football the next year, the Saints kept building. Equipped with defensive end Will Smith, Drew Brees was given the keys to the bus. By 2009, the Superdome hosted its first NFC championship. We won. Crowd went into a frenzy. A while ago, they used to wear paper bags and also called us the Aints. Then it became what some people thought it never would. Home of the Super Bowl champions. <laughs> And I'm not so sure it isn't the Superdome all over again. It's unbelievable. Just think where this club was just four short years ago. It was a storybook run, which began the night of the rebirth. Rebirth of a city. And now we're saying, who that? Say they're going to beat them saints. I wouldn't trade that uh, 06 return to the Dome for the Super Bowl game. I mean, Number one, in my mind, is the, is the 06 Monday night game against Atlanta. Number two is the Super Bowl game. That was the rebirth moment. And I think it was perfectly defined and 
encompassed in that rebirth statue. Give it to us. Nice. The last time I had a nine foot statue of me unveiled was uh, never. <laughs> It's a fitting name for it. It constitutes our rebirth. It, it constituted for us that, you know, we were down, but we were not out. And that statue is a reminder for us that we can withstand anything. For me, the statue is a symbol of the commitment of the people in the region who chose to return and rebuild. Their commitment and strength was far greater than any of the players on the field. As a team, we were a representation of them. I think the statue means a lot more now because how he's faced what is a horrible, horrible disease, he's showed that you can still accomplish things. What's the story to tell him about that statue and that man? Well, I, I tell him, I tell him he can just, he can do anything, he puts his, he puts his uh, heart in mind. Before every Saints game, I'll walk out and I'll just touch the statue for luck, both luck for the Saints to do well, but also for me to get as lucky as I did uh, during the Dome coming. So the Saints force the punt by Bosher, standing at his one yard line. The list of amazing memories made at the Superdome grew again in 2015 in another game against the Falcons. Former Saints special teams ace Rich Morty was there. It happened so fast we didn't... Initially... Watching his son Mike, a Saints linebacker. I've got the binoculars on him. I'm watching him breathe. I'm watching him where he's aligned. And boom, they snap the ball. And here comes number 56 right up the middle. I don't know if you can call it a block because when you actually see it, I mean, it's like the kick hits his chest and it's kind of a smother. <laughs> the ball kind of squirted out and he, and he recovered it for a touchdown. It's blocked and into the end zone with it is the Saints, Michael Marty. As Mike blocked his punt, I'm pretty sure the entire dome was thinking the same thing. This is almost identical to 2006. The Saints have the block. Here's Kane and the and they get blocked. And they have the touchdown. Covered by the Saints for a touchdown. Just like what Gleason did. What a great job, Shades, of Steve Gleason. All of a sudden, we found out Steve was, you know, in the crowd, you know, right behind us. And, you know, you got to know Gleason, but he's got this, like, look, even with his breathing apparatus, you know, you could almost and just anticipate his little, you know what, grin. Michael Morty, son of Rich, makes a great play, and boy, is he happy on the Saints bench, and for good reason. Well, I, we're all happy. After the game, he said, you know what, Dad? He said, I've visualized that play a thousand times in my head since I've been sitting in that stand 10 years ago. I get to be there to watch Steve do it and to have that moment and then to do it and then to have Steve there, I get to say now, I give him in the same sentence as Steve in that moment, uh, which attaches to so many other things in the city, the rebirth. It's one of those plays you dream about. September 25th, 2006, Steve Gleason just know, knows the similarities to that play from nine years ago to what just happened here. I knew I had a decent shot of it and it wasn't until halftime I came in and looked at the photo and I said what's the Gleason picture doing up here because it was the only photo on the screen you know it's kind of a lightning striking twice sort of thing I, uh, it did touch the uh, I did touch the statue that day <laughs> the cool thing was that you know Steve was here to see that and you know I, they, they throw him up there on the jumbotron and man that brought back some good memories um, obviously we get to add tonight to, to those as well I think any Saints fan, it used to be they talk about John Gilliam's kickoff return in 1967, you know. It had begun like a dream, 
a touchdown on their first play. From Dempsey with the kick in Tulane, you know what I mean? We're not going to ever forget that. The longest field goal in the history of the National Football League. But the most memorable play in this franchise history is that block punt in 2006. And, and for a lot of good reasons, not just football. All right, we're going to play a little waltz for y'all. Here, where the sights and sounds are like no other, the story of the rebirth is now a permanent part. Its impact expanding all the time. I had a football, I would have had three. I had a football from the Steve Gleason game, from the opening game. It meant a lot to me, sentimental. But what it did is it meant a lot more to the kids that I was coaching because they didn't have uniforms. Wind up selling the football for 900 bucks. Bought my team some uniforms to play. It's clear to me that the punk block in 2006 has benefited me in starting conversation that has buoyed some of my efforts. Thanks to his tireless work, the Steve Gleason Act was signed into law in 2015. It ensures that speech generating devices and technology are covered under federal Medicare and Medicaid programs. That just doesn't happen, you know, uh, he's not a lobbyist but I think he's using his platform to show this needs to be changed, not only for myself, but what about the other individuals that may not have the name notoriety. In a city known for its joie de vivre, a rare place where music grows on trees, a party can break out at any moment. Still, even in New Orleans, some parties are more than just lively. Some give new life. Just that black punt made such a big difference. We all needed that. That new beginning. And it inspired people tremendously to move forward. Thank y'all. Yeah, merci.